This episode of Healing Together is brought to you by Let's Get Checked, the leading provider of at-home health tests. Ladies, did you know that hormone imbalance symptoms can range from insomnia, weight gain, or feeling tired all the time, to breast tenderness, skin rashes, or changes in blood pressure? Female hormone function is important for a number of different situations, including polycystic ovary syndrome, ovarian failure, low ovarian reserve, early menopause, menopause, thyroid issues, and ovulation function. With Let's Get Checked, you can do a simple at-home health test that will give you a complete picture of your hormonal health in five days. So how does the process work? Let's Get Checked delivers a test straight to your door. You just self-collect a blood sample from the tip of your finger and mail the sample back to their accredited laboratories with a prepaid label. You'll receive support and guidance from the Let's Get Checked medical team who are available 24-7 to offer you personalized advice. This week, Let's Get Checked is inviting you to try an at-home test for 30% off with a discount code TOGETHER30. Go to letsgetchecked.com and enter TOGETHER30, TOGETHER30, and Let's Get Checked. Welcome to Healing Together. I'm Nicholas Boileau. You may know B.J. Miller from the short Netflix documentary Endgame, or his TED Talk, or numerous other appearances and articles, or even his book, A Beginner's Guide to the End. BJ is a powerful voice for redesigning healthcare, and specifically end-of-life care. We talk about his ideas around depathologizing death, and the difference between necessary and unnecessary suffering. We look into our neurotic relationship to experiencing pain, and how to be there for others when they are suffering. And we address the important distinction between curing and healing. BJ's perspective on end of life is important because our culture puts so much emphasis on avoiding death instead of integrating it into our lives. So without further delay, my conversation with BJ Miller. I'm here with BJ Miller. Welcome and thank you so much for joining me. It's 6 a.m. your time. I know it's early and I'm wondering if we can start off with uh, just a brief overview of your story. A lot of people know it, but our listeners may not, and how you got to where you are, your journey thus far. Sure, Nicholas. Hi, and it's nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. The past is filled with all sorts of things, but the sort of the big event that took me that really carved the arc of my my life in so many ways was it was were some injuries I sustained in college. So uh, sophomore year, in 1990, uh, some friends of mine and I were screwing around on a commuter train out east. And just it was just parked train. It wasn't moving or anything. We didn't we decided to climb it more like you'd climb a tree. But anyway, what, it turned out you know, the wires that run overhead there and the, the power of the train from above. And so when we got up on top of the train and I stood up, I had a metal watch on and the electricity – I got close enough to the power source, electricity arc to the watch. And that resulted in uh, the amputation of both legs below the knee and then my left arm below the elbow and a sort of a tussle with death for a good six weeks or so in there too. So yeah, very eye-opening experience really rocked my world in all sorts of ways, but also taught me many things and set me on a different course. Were you planning to be a doctor before this happened? No. Uh, no, I had really – I hadn't planned much anything at that point. I was very much in the liberal arts mode. I was thinking about a career in East Asian studies and I was interested in China. and But, I, but, but really, I had no firm idea what I was going to do at all. But nowhere on that list was medicine, um, and it was entirely my experience as a patient that turned me on to both the power of medicine and what it, what a wonderful thing it is. I mean, it certainly saved my life. There's no two ways about it. And I met some amazing people. But it's also, you know, as a patient, you're pretty quickly uh, aware of the pitfalls and the shortcomings of the healthcare system as well. So it felt I was attracted to it both for its power and it's like what it was doing well, and also that maybe there were some ways to improve it. And for both reasons, I went into medicine. Well, it's an incredible story, and we could spend an enormous amount of time just on your story, but I'm going to move us to the future to now. You talk a lot about the notion of depathologizing death. 
I think this is really important right now because we're in the midst of this pandemic where a lot of us are looking at death in a new light, like something that can actually happen to us in the near term. Mm -hmm. This is something you learned early, but many of us just live our lives thinking it's it's really far away. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can explain what you mean by depathologizing death. There's a, there's a, there are a lot of important points in here, uh, I think. So I mean a couple of things. One, pathology implies something has gone wrong, uh, that something aberrant that has happened, something abnormal has happened. And it's a medical convention to separate pathological things from normal things. It can be useful a useful tool to delineate and demarcate where illness begins and, and health leaves off. But it's so fraught. Our notions of what's healthy or normal are pretty narrow. And in medicine, this sort of standard person is this is the person for whom nothing goes wrong. And of course, that's not very normal. Uh, that is not a normal life. That may be helpful in a laboratory to discern one slide from the next or one specimen from the next. But for us out in the world, getting sick is normal. Illness is normal. Disability is normal. Death sure as hell is normal. So I, what I mean first of all here is to, to remove the accidental shaming that medical conventions can do. There is nothing wrong with you for dying. And, and, and sadly, I've worked with so many people who not only have to deal with the sorrow and, and sadness of saying goodbye to a life, but have to feel ashamed for it. Because of these sort of this overlay in our languaging and in our customs that has a way of sidelining you if you're sick. So that's primarily what I mean. And, and secondarily, I also mean to just remove or, 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 or blur the subject out of the medical lens. Medicine very powerful and has a lot to offer this subject. But it, it, dying is not a medical event per se. It's a, it's a natural event. It's a human event. It's many things. So that's what that's what I'm trying to do here is de-shame the subject so we don't feel worse than we need to and also to remind ourselves that medicine is one lens among many. I'm feeling a weird parallel with what's been going on the last 10, 15 years in popular culture when it comes to social media and we're all showing the best aspects of our lives online. Yeah. And you start to feel ashamed when things go wrong. And I remember a Buddhist monk telling me, when things go wrong is just as much life as when things go right. And all of us are buzzing around trying to get everything fixed so that we can enjoy life. Yeah. And he was just saying, life is the things going wrong. It is the illness. It is the argument with your spouse or the getting up and not feeling as good as all your Facebook friends look. Oh, amen, brother. Oh, it's such it's and it's so dastardly that effect and then what it can do to this your sense of self. And I'm sorry to cut you off. I just vehemently agree with you here. No, I'm so glad. And please do. And maybe you can talk a little bit about at one point you say in one of your talks, you're looking forward to a time when the medical community crosses out the term palliative care and calls it health care. Yeah. So I mean, so palliative care, let's just say for a second, let's just define that because that's, that is not a well understood concept. So, I mean, that is my discipline. That's a, that is a medical subspecialty since 2006, but that uh, medical subspecialty is officially called hospice and palliative medicine. And we've, the ideas and the tenets of palliative care in, lar in a lot of ways grew out of the end of life and, 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 and hospice and end of life care. And, uh, we do, work with death a lot because death is common. But one thing to get very, very clear about palliative care is it's um, it's not simply about death. It's it, Palliative care is the multidisciplinary pursuit of quality of life within the context of serious illness. So my job as a palliative care doctor is to help people feel as good as possible whether or not their situation is fixable, whether or not they're curable. My job is to help them deal with the reality they have period. So that's that's what I do. That is palliative care. Uh, it includes end-of-life care. It includes hospice, but is not limited to the end of life in any way. So that's really, really critical to, for, for, ever, for all of us to get because palliative care ends up being 
you know, no one wants it because if you think it's about dying, well, then few people are interested. <laughs> but when you realize that it's simply about quality of life and not suffering, well, then it's then then it's a much happier affair, and people tend to to seek it out and want it. So, pad the reason I say that is if you look at the definition of palliative care, you know, basically the treatment of suffering and the pursuit of quality of life. Well. That's where the rubber meets the road for just for all of us in every situation. I mean, the reason I'm interested in a, in surgery on this or that body part or or treating this or that illness is on behalf of my quality of life. On, is on behalf of me feeling as well as I can. So feeling well is on a spectrum. It's not again. It's not whether you're pathological or normal. It's a spectrum that we're all on all the time. And I just think the mitigation of suffering in the pursuit of quality of life is a much better goal for all of healthcare than is to say, uh, let's stave off all illnesses and all trouble all the time. Gosh, maybe if it were possible to do that, maybe I'd be interested. But frankly, we human beings are so dependent on uh, on the sort of back and forth between joy and sorrow, et cetera. That we really need this emotional spectrum to place ourselves in the world. And honestly, Nicholas, I don't know. I, I rarely meet anyone who's – when push come to shove is all that interested in living forever. And I think we learn too much from our suffering to dispense with it. And you know, again, if we could dispense with suffering, maybe I would be interested in it. But it just, it's just proven to be impossible. So, yeah, I do think that all of healthcare should see itself as translating to the benefit to the patient, the quality to the patient. And we don't need a subspecialty like palliative We shouldn't need a subspecialty like palliative care to remind ourselves uh, of the importance of caring for each other, of loving each other, of feeling well. Sorry, now I feel preachy, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. Well, that's really important, and it's important at a time when we're concentrating enormous resources and energy and probably concurrently an enormous amount of emotional energy in this pursuit of avoiding death yeah. at nearly any cost. Yeah. Well, first, let me just clarify. I mean, it, it is enormous bulge of costs. That is true. If you just follow the Medicare spending, a, a roughly a third of it is meted out in a person the last year or so of a person's life. And plenty of that's appropriate because towards the end of life is often when we're sickest and when we often need the most care. But what you're pointing to is, is undoubtedly a huge piece of this, which is the frenzy to stave off death at all costs. And I don't want to talk anyone into spending or caring less about protecting or preserving life or extending life. But I do think we need to keep it in a sense of proportionality about this. And again, I – you know, I'd ask you, Nicholas, I mean, if do you really want to live forever? Is that really something on your list? Because um, at some point, death is going to be even welcome, sad as hell, but maybe even welcome. But back to your point, and the, the point your Buddhist monk friend made is we we humans do this funny thing where we, especially in the West, trying to ch flee from suffering and flee from death, we suffer more. We run ourselves ragged and in some ways we probably invite death sooner than it needs to be. In so many ways, our pain comes from the resistance to things as much as it does from the thing itself. And that kind of spending sends a signal to each other that death is horrible and something to stave off again at all costs. But that also leads to a version of life being propped up on machines, for example, indefinitely because you have a heartbeat. For most people, that doesn't constitute life, but you're, that I think is a very – that's a big tell in there about where our healthcare, how our healthcare system is wired and how we, the voting public, continue to wire it. And then when it does come to death, there's a lot of pressure to have a good death. I think in one of your talks, you say – and I'm quoting you here – and if you hold that out as a goal there – and you're talking about patients – are just going to yeah. feel like they're failing. Yeah. And it's so sad. Oh, it saddens me more than just about anything to see folks who are, you know, have done all their work. They've loved each other. They're just sweet families and they're really, you know, they're trying so hard to accept this thing they can't change, i.e. I, their, their death is coming. And, you know, there's a real grace and a real power to 
to yielding to what you can't change or at least to working with what you can't change. And I see people doing that really beautiful work and then only to feel from just a wayward a comment from somebody or a medicalized language or whatever it is, you find your way to feel guilty or feel bad about feeling bad, feeling bad about feeling sad, feeling ashamed to die. I mean, you just follow follow the language. He succumbed to his illness. He lost the battle. Uh, she failed treatment, we even say in medicine, as though the patient is the one failing when treatment doesn't work. Or we say their health is failing. You know, our language is a sort of a tell. And if you follow the, follow that language, we should all feel really terrible about dying. We should feel very guilty about dying, like we screwed up, like it's a mistake, like it's my life was hard and here my death is one more thing I'm screwing up. Have you seen this work its way into patients' um, psyches, hearing that language and seeing them feel worse just because they're failing at staying oh, alive? absolutely. And it doesn't end with the patient. Uh, families absorb it too. Um, caregivers think they should have done something more, could have done something more. Clinicians as well. It has something to do with how uh, a lot of us in, in healthcare burn out is because it implies an, a very unrealistic expectation. If 100% of us are gonna die, well then there's no fail, there's no failing it, there's no failure at it. Um, and so we doctors absorb that same kind of mantle. This has a lot to do with by why being a doctor is so darn hard. So absolutely, and then it, it also lends this performance piece to dying. Um, like you mentioned, Nicholas, that it also sets up the notion of a good death. In other words, sort of implying that you can do it, you can do a good job of dying or you can do a crappy job of dying. You know, I wrote a book about this. I've, a lot of us care about dying as well as possible, being ourselves until the end, avoiding unnecessary traps of suffering, uh, saying goodbyes, um, being with people we love feeling at peace, you know, those, of, I, I think I and many of us would aspire to wind our lives down in such a fashion. But that's an aspiration, no matter how much homework you do, and how good a job you do of dying, it's still gonna be hard, there's still gonna be pain, there's still gonna be sorrow. So um, I, you know, this, this idea of death as being this horrible, abnormal thing sets us up to try to do it better. And I've seen folks suffer from the sort of the casual shaming that we've been talking about, but I've also seen people set them up, selves up for failure because they, you know, it becomes an, another overachieving moment where they've got to do everything just so. And if it falls out of line, then that, then that death went poorly. You were just talking about the pain and suffering and that we can all expect. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about necessary and unnecessary suffering? which is something I've heard you talk about. Yeah. So I, you know, I want to be really careful here because I think a lot of us imagine death to, you know, for all sorts of reasons. And by the way, it's not just our languaging. Of course, we are wired to run away from anything that's threatening our lives. I mean, this is, there's, it's not simply these social constructs or language that is the problem. We have hormones that affect how we behave and think and act and when we're our, when our life is under is, is threatened we we step into a different mode uh the fight or flight mode so so i just want to be clear here too that it's not simply that we are wired to, to there's an allergy there's an inborn allergy to this subject that we have to contend with so it's just hard period squaring the end of your existence, the only thing you've really ever known, trying to imagine your ego, you dying, the you and you dying, not being here because you being here is the only thing that's allowed you to experience the world in the first place. I mean, it's a real men mental, tr there's some trickery in there. It is very hard to imagine one's own demise. So it does come with its own tangles and tussles. And then physically too, a body shutting down Aches and pains, nausea, things like that are common. 
But I want to be clear here. A lot of that stuff's treatable. So pains and suffering in that way, physical nausea, things like that. There's a lot we can do to treat that pain. Dying does not have to be this miserable experience. But even if you treat all your pain and you feel physically pretty darn well, you've still got to square this idea of you ending. And so one way or another, there's, uh, I think it's fair to say that suffering is going to wind its way through the subject for most or all of us to some degree. Just, by the way, just like daily life. I don't draw any distinction between the two, really. Um, so as in daily life, we deal with it. You know, like we don't – if a storm blows through and rips our house up, we deal with it. That's a necessary suffering, an act of nature, a part of the deal, something that just happens. But that's very different from lighting each other's houses on fire and making life harder than it needs to be for ourselves and for each other. There's a huge distinction in there. And so the natural suffering, the stuff that's just going to come no matter what you do, you know, my advice is don't fight it so much because it's just going to keep coming. And that's a losing battle. So there the work for necessary suffering is to make peace with it, to work with it. If you can't kick it out of your life, well, then you might as well use it, work with it, roll around with it, learn from it. Um, let it help you understand the joys of, uh, of, of pleasure, of the absence of suffering in those moments where you see a sunset or with your, with a friend or someone you love, et cetera. So all that's powerful and like the highest human developmental stuff. What I mean to skim out is where we act casually take on treatments that aren't likely going to work, but incur tons of side effects, including huge costs to our wallet or to our body or to our spirit, or the way we casually hurt each other with our language or sloppy language, or the way we accidentally avoid each other who, when we're in pain and make our lives even harder and isolate ourselves and each other when we're hurting. Those are the unnecessary levels of suffering. That stuff's made up. It doesn't have to be. So I think this is especially when it comes to designing our healthcare system. We should be much smarter. We know what's going to cause each other to suffer. We know better. So that stuff needs to be pulled out. That's life's work right there is to is is to is to call that out and improve upon it. So the unnecessary suffering summons a very different response. That's where I get angry. That's where I push back. That's what I want to work on. That's where I want to dig into systems. That's where I need help. That that's so that those those are two very different responses: unnecessary su suffering versus necessary suffering. And, and I think it's a really important distinction because you're never going to get rid of all of the suffering, and you shouldn't feel bad about that. Well, and it also sounds like the unnecessary suffering can be in our own minds, right? We we pile on meanings and the forecast of pain and the memory of pain when really the moment of pain may be limited in both in time and in scope, but then what we do to it emotionally and intellectually and psychologically can actually exacerbate it a lot more, right? Oh, brother. Amen, Nicholas. Yes, there's so much to this. This meets, this, this, this plays out in so many ways. And this is where we can accidentally become our own worst enemy. We can latch on to our miseries. We can... Um, love our miseries a little too much we can prop them up to make stories from them and it's interesting you know the ways that which we do that to ourselves and to each other through our constructs through our behaviors etc it almost it's almost can feel fetishized you know and i feel like it has something to do with how we've accidentally put ourselves in the closet for suffering in the first place that we have all these uh, neurotic relationships with our suffering versus if we saw it as just a most natural thing in the world that came like blue and like a storm and blew out too, I don't think we'd have such a neurotic relationship to it. And I don't think we'd accidentally perpetuate it in ourselves or need to defend it because people are um, not acknowledging it, not giving us space or whatever else. I've watched myself as a disabled person, especially early on, uh, when I had more physical pain, I almost I remember people, doctors included, didn't deal with pain very well. And if I showed my pain, um, then at least I would get some 
space or some sympathy or some response. And the more dramatic I was about my pain, the more response I got. And unless I made some big point about my pain, people were way too quick to blow past it and not deal with it. So you find yourself in these little moments of theater where you're actually promoting or, or perpetuating your own miseries to make a point, to get a response or whatever it is. So Oh, I hear myself dragging on on this one, Nicholas, but you really, you're pointing to something really subtle and important. And it's not just what we do to each other. It's how, it's what we do to ourselves with this. Yeah. I don't think you're dragging on at all. And when I hear you, I think of the, the competition of pain that some of us engage in, even at these weird levels like business, you know, I'm so busy. I have meeting after meeting after meeting. It's almost this weird, like, competing for who's in the worst position yep. so that we can get the most credit. Like I have more points than it's you true. in pain yeah. points. I do it too, by the way. And you just put your finger right on it though. On the one I do, I hear myself invoking my busyness all the time. And sometimes it's an excuse, but oftentimes it's like to build out a skirt to gives me a build, to give me some credit or to give me some space, just as you're saying, Oh, amen. But th- that must be because that's what we trade in, I think, yeah. right? We we don't trade in self-respect and being okay when someone says, you know, I'm sorry, I can't do this. We trade in this commodity of busyness. Yep. And what's weird is, you're right, that's how we give our, each other more space. We're more generous when we feel someone is hurting. It is a funny thing and undeniable, and we really got to watch it. Um, like I say, I do it all the time. I catch myself doing this all the time. But but it's appropriate too, in a way, right? We need to know when people are hurting. Absolutely. Absolutely we do. And I guess if we had a more tender, subtle, nuanced response to each other's pain, we wouldn't have to make such a show of it. And if we saw it as just a natural part of life, among other things too, then we wouldn't be uh, – the currency wouldn't be pity or you know or drama. I I don't know how far back you could trace this impulse, but my sense is it's gotten ramped up of late. But and and I think it's, there's like a perverse thing. I remember early on as a disabled person. Well, I mean, even look at my how much of my careers has come from my own personal story and much of our conversation. Of course, what qualifies me to have this conversation is less my being a doctor and more the fact that I, as a human being, have lost some things. So if I'm not careful, I could I could just make my disability in my job and I could become a professional professional disabled person. That would be my thing. And I watch people do that in healthcare. They become professional patients, both from the busyness of it, because there's so many appointments, but because of the identity, the 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 bag of of identity cues that come with it. Yeah, I think you're an example to all of us for how not to do that and how to live a rich life without without making a show of your pain. Well, there is there is definitely and there's something in there. There's some there's a good middle path in there for us, right? Because it's not the the heroic. I don't I don't have any pain. I'm fine. I have no troubles. That sort of heroic thing doesn't really cut it. You're you're just not being honest, and you're pre- presenting this perfect thing that isn't real. Um, similarly, if you just, I have, I am only my problems. I am only my disability. If I over identify with it, that leads to another batch of problems. So to be clear for, if, if I'm sounding confusing, it, I am maybe sounding like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but really it's more being somewhere health in a healthy state suspended in between these poles where you are aware of your, of your pain, but you're not, um, trading on it or that's not the, central carving tool of your identity. So yes, work with it. I acknowledge it, but proportionally. And I think you hit on something really, you said something really beautiful, which is that it may be because we, even though we have the quote unquote best medical care in the world, or at least for some people and the best capabilities, I should say that we may not have the most tender and understanding response to pain. Do you mean, Nicholas, specifically in ourselves or in one another? I would say in both. I think that's how I heard it when you when you said it. You yeah. you said something about it may be because we don't respond as tenderly and uh, with as yep. much understanding as we could. Yep. And yeah. that's not exactly what you said, but that's what I heard. And it right. feels like maybe 
we do have a bit of a, we're in a, a place where the culture is a little cold. Yeah. And so we need to speak up. We feel we need to speak up louder to be heard. Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly right. I, I think I get it. I'm in front of a lot of people who are in pain. Myself, uh, people reach out to me, friends of friends reach out to me because they're in pain. There's a pain crisis, there's spiritual pain or physical pain, whatever else. I, I, I'm in front of it a, a lot and maybe inordinately so. But these days, it's not hard to find yourself in front of someone in pain. It's all over the place. And when I start get, to watching my tension rise and my exasperation with it, and when I start getting frustrated, I hear myself not wanting to hear another story of someone else's pain. I hear myself doing the same thing of shutting people down or shutting it out. And I've gotten to a point where I realize <clears> – <throat> I think the trick here for me anyway is uh, – that could lead to a more tender response is – to have a compassionate response to feel something on a behalf of a fellow human being is it's really where the action is. So I don't necessarily have to take on responsibility for somebody else's pain. I think a lot of us are don't respond well is because we think there's an ask in there. If we acknowledge someone's pain, then somehow we're going to be responsible for it. We're going to have to do something about it or somehow be asked to fix it or whatever else. Uh, on some level, practical and spiritual, it's like asking us – to present someone with your pain is is asking them to take on something. And so I think it's been very helpful for me to parse that out a little bit. Is it asking too much for me to feel something? No, no. There's an endless realm. There's an endless rung of feelings inside of me that's not going to run out. But my time is valuable. What I can do or what I can offer to that pain may be different. But – I think there's a nuance here if you can separate. You're not being asked – having a compassion response isn't necessarily being asked to, to do something, to fix it, etc. It could be enough to just feel something even for a moment on behalf of that fellow human being. And I think if we could do that, I think we could upend. I think we could all build out our capacity to, to sit with pain that we can't fix. But right now, sitting with pain that we can't fix, given all that we're talking about, feels like an invitation or an expectation that we need to fix it somehow in some magical way. So sorry, another tangent there. But I, I've been trying to tease that out for myself so that I don't burn out and find myself just perpetuating the allergy to pain. I hope that makes some sense. I was a little circular. It makes so much sense. It's such a beautiful distinction to say that you can listen to someone, you can feel something, and you don't have to take on the burden of actually doing something for them. Yeah. And yeah. my belief is that for a lot of people, just being heard, which comes across so well when anyone feels compassion, Yeah, right? We, we detect that. And just being heard is often enough. Yep. And that bearing witness, that being heard, feeling understood, or even not even understood, just feeling heard. I hope we all, before we die, have a moment where someone, where we, where we get to experience someone seeing us, hearing us, feeling us for all that we are, warts, everything, and whatever it is, and not judging us, just seeing us. I hope, I hope we all get to feel that at least once before we die, that acceptance, that commonality, that camaraderie, that, hey, I'm on this planet at the same time you are too. I'm here too. I'm a fellow human being. I see you. That is huge. I mean, it's maybe the hugest. And in some ways, it's so simple. Um, you sort of have to drop, drop your judgment, drop the expectation and just be present with someone. And it doesn't take very long. But boy, it's magical stuff. And it really works wonders for people on the receiving end. And on the giving end, it sounds like you don't get depleted when you do that. Right, right. And on the giving end, it works great too because this endless stream of, of life, of feeling, of feeling part of all sorts of things in this world, being of this world, all that stuff gets to flow through you in those moments. You just got to watch your neurotic, I'm going to fix something, heroic brain or the expectation brain. That's where things get wonky. But with all that passion and feeling flowing through you, that is the same thing as being – that is very much a life force. That is being alive. And I clean my – try to keep my filters clean so that I can feel all that stuff. Yeah. So giver, receiver, I'm not sure there's much of a difference. And that's where things – that's where you know care, caring is really 
is really working. If the giver and the receiver are both being filled up, that's you've really then you're in a really good you're in the right place. This is so important. I think we envision healthcare as a non reciprocal relationship. Yeah. I think as a patient, it's depleting for me too. I feel I'm imposing on my doctor and I took yep. too long and I'm bringing up too many things. So I try to limit, you know, the number of moles I'm going to have my dermatologist look at yeah. out of consideration for her. So there's this weird sense that it's a one way street. But I think what you're saying is sometimes without the doing, just the being, Mm -hmm. It can be a two-way street. Hey, we're both humans sitting in this room and part of the same endless cycle of life. And, you know, let's just appreciate that for a moment. When, I, when, you know, when you're keyed in with someone like that, Nicholas, in a way you, you, you're bigger, right? You're feeling together this, this expanse. You're sharing something. That connection makes you bigger, like, kind, of, kind of literally. That is some – seriously healing stuff. I mean, this is what I think we most long for is to be fully seen and not have to hide or decorate ourselves to fool ourselves and each other into thinking that we're perfect. Letting ourselves just be whatever the heck we are and even dropping the adjectives, you know, good, bad, whatever, dropping the adjectives maybe all together. Anyway, yeah. This is where the giver should be thankful and vice versa. And when, when caregiving is reciprocal like that, then it becomes a virtuous circle. Then it's an anti-burnout force. And then for you on the, on the patient side, Nicholas, just to stick with your example, you're not feeling ashamed to be in pain. You're feeling seen and heard. You don't feel like you have to chop yourself up and deliver yourself in a tidy package to your doctor just to suit their purposes. I mean, it's, that is essentially what we're talking about here is the description of how one gets to feel whole. That's cheap. doesn't cost anything. It's actually pretty easy and it doesn't take much time. But sadly, it's one of the first things that gets crowded out when we're frenzied, when yeah. we're distracted. You use the word healing. This can be a really healing experience. Can you just say a little bit about healing versus curing? Oh uh, yeah, such a good distinction. Rachel Remen taught me this one early on. Um, I would have maybe you know conflated the two or not discerned much of a difference. But healing, the same root as health, uh, hospitality too. There's sort of all these sort of ideas of of caring, but really it's about wholeness. So when um, so healing is, I can feel whole in the ways we're talking about. If I take a narrow view on life that it's just that my that health is a, a series of body parts that need to be functioning well and in place, um, and without them you're not you you're disassembled, you're not whole. You know that's that narrow medical lens. It's just not it's just not big enough. In my own journey, I'm I got friggin' dismembered. You know I lo literally lost body parts. I have fewer body parts, right? But I got to be I got to feel whole again. I don't feel myself as an incomplete person. It took me a while to get there, but I don't look at my body and see things that are lacking. I see it for what it is. I see what, what is there. And you can imagine that the relief that comes with that shift when you no longer see yourself as someone lacking or missing stuff or someone who used to be something. The point where I can see myself and see it as a whole entity – not missing something, that's the moment I feel that's the moment I'm healed. And that doesn't mean I'm gonna grow my legs back. No, I've got to the place where I don't need them. I am what I am. And that's possible in a deathbed too. I see it happen. Where on some level, by some narrow definition of health or heal or healing, a dying person is anything but healed. But in the ways we're talking about it, no, you can be falling apart, you can be dying, you can and, and still be whole. You can be intact. You can be a complete entity. And it's mostly an attitude or a mind shift or a spirit, not uh, an accounting of body parts and their functions. So healing is practically always possible. And it's largely an internally driven piece. And if we take the scope of healing, then our friendship, Nicholas, or my relationship with my doctor – all that stuff is they're 
advocating, helping me do the work. Unfortunately, we often hand ourselves over to our doctor and say, fix me. And my job is to just lie still and get out of the way. In healing, no, you got to participate. But the, tr- the upshot there, that means that healing is always possible and you always have agency in your healing. Curing, well, you know, curing is much more cut and dry. It was, it was off and now it's on. It was bad, now it's good. It wasn't working, now it works. And, you know, with modern medicine, a lot is curable. And curing is a sexy thing, very exciting. I'm all for curing when it's possible. The trouble is it's not always possible. And then we end up accidentally abandoning each other. Uh, our doctor, as a doctor, I abandon people when I say, so, so sorry, Nicholas, there's nothing more we can do. I should never have her say that as a doctor. I should say, Nicholas, I'm so sorry. There's nothing more we can do to push back on this disease. But I'm here with you, brother. As a fellow human being, I'm here. Let's, you know, if you need anything, whatever. I'm, a, I'm not running away. I believe what you're getting at is that at every moment of the journey, even when there is no cure, quote unquote, you can still be whole and be present and be going through this moment in the journey as yourself and actually appreciate where you are. And that doesn't mean it does a wonderful, pleasant feeling. You have to wrap your, you have to welcome all feelings. But yes, yes, sir, what you just described, amen. I, I realize we're moving towards the end of our time. It, I wanted to, if you don't mind, just talk about death as potentially a good thing, which often is is antithetical to how we think about it. But death might also be a slipping back into what I came from. It's not like the carbon matter goes away, right? It just changes form the way water might change to steam or the way our cells turn back to dust and dirt, which happens continuously throughout our lives. Every day I'm shedding cells, I'm shedding parts of myself, and they're continuing on just in a different form. Is there a way we can develop an appreciation for death without layering a religious interpretation, but simply from the evidence that while we are changing form when we die, the stuff we're made of will stick around. It'll continue on. Yeah. I'm so with you. I mean, you just described, I mean, this is, this is empirical, you know, energy just, just, we just, all you can say about death, all we can really say about death is that it's a change. It's an ending, but when it comes to atoms, when it comes to energy, there is no end. It just shifts. It moves. It changes shape, changes form. And, and that's what we're made of. We are stardust. There is a f- fixed number of atoms in the world that have ever been in this universe. Uh, it's not in the world, and in the universe. And we're just that dust that just keeps changing shape, coming together in one form, losing that shape, becoming something else. Yeah. I mean, on and on and on. And we're, and we're this shape for a far shorter time than we've been yeah. all the other shapes we've been. Yeah. There's a great quote. There's a Stoics quote. I can't remember if it's Marcus Aurelius. Like, like, but something basically to your point. Like, why do we fear death? We, we were dead a long time before we were born. We're just going back to that, whatever that, wherever that was, whatever that was. Um, yeah. And it's, it, we spend a lot of time in a quote unquote dead state. <laughs> and on some level, as you're pointing from a metaphysical point of view, it's something on some level on our bones that we should be familiar with in, in, in our bones. But just in a practical sense, just day to day, daily life sense, yeah, you're sloughing cells all the time. Little deaths are happening when your hair falls out, when you go to the bathroom. I mean, it's just endless. It, dying is happening to not only around us all the time, leaves falling from trees, whatever it is. It's happening in us all the time too. So death is not this exotic foreign entity that we know nothing about. On some level, it's in a, on, in very real ways, it's in our bones. You have a relationship already with death. It is not such an exotic thing and maybe not such a terrifying thing. It can feel sad that this, this particular amalgam of cells has to come to a close but it's going to keep going in some form or another. There's immortality is just sort of a fact in this way once you let go of the ego. And so there's a lot to kind of – that allows us to open a relationship with the subject. And once I have a relationship with the subject, then I can see what it does for me. 
And you know what? What makes anything precious but that it ends? So <clears throat> I can love my 30-year-old bottle of wine, and I particularly love it because that that was time in a bottle, as they say. When I drink that bottle, the poignancy is the fact that it that there is no more of it, that that particular bottle is coming to close. You know that that is its power. The fact that we have a finite amount of time in this body is exactly what gives your and my conversation together, Nicholas, importance. What gives it respect? What makes it say both you and I are taking time from our day to spend with each other? The fact that that time is finite is exactly what gives this conversation its power. What it exactly gives the gift of, of spending your time with someone, that the source of that gift is in so many ways death. So, so boy, we can go on and on about this. But from the practical to the metaphysical, death is all over the place. We know it more than we think we do. And on some level, it sets us up to really appreciate life. If I had an endless stream of those beautiful bottles of wine, would I care? Would I taste it so much? Would I would I use it thoughtfully? Probably not. So anyway, as we try to find a way to see death and relate to it and, and be okay with it, again, I just want to be really clear. That doesn't mean we crowd out hard feelings. We still get to have sadness about it. We still get to feel everything we're going to feel about it. But maybe we don't have to hate it on top of it. Maybe we don't have to hate ourselves for dying on top of everything else. Sorrow, sadness, those are not the enemy. I so appreciate that. And I love the idea of of being sad but not hating the moment or hating the thing. And I really appreciate what you said about maybe calling it or thinking of it as change, not death. Yeah. I hate to have this conversation die because mm -hmm. I feel we could go on, but um, I know time is precious and I really, really appreciate the time you spent here and, and your um, perspective. It is a real pleasure talking to you, compadre. I really appreciate you taking the time with me, Nicholas. So thank you. Hey, it's Nicholas. Before you turn off this podcast, I wanted to alert you to B.J. Miller's latest project, which he didn't mention in our conversation. It's called Metal Health, and it aims to provide personalized, holistic consultations for any patient or caregiver who needs help navigating the practical, emotional, and existential issues that come with serious illness or disability. You can find out more at Metal Health, M-E-T-T-L-E Health, one word, dot com. Healing Together is produced by Healthenly. Our theme song, Ramble, is composed and performed by Ed Morneau.